Good evening and welcome to our midweek service. Glad you're joining us for wherever you are. We're going to begin tonight with a song, I'm on the winning side. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burning down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. Side. Good evening and welcome wherever you're joining us tonight by way of the internet. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to be able to come before you and preach a little bit tonight and be a blessing and continue on in the book of Revelation. Excited here in just a few minutes to preach what the Lord has given us as we've walked through and I have fully and thoroughly enjoyed the series with our staff walking through the Revelation and so tonight we'll continue uh, here on this first Wednesday night of the new year and uh, just keep pressing on but would you make your home a place of worship a place for the spirit of the Lord to move in and Jesus just to sit down amongst you tonight and inhabit your place your home and uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer you pray with us and ask God to feel your presence and speak to you and let you be touched tonight and be encouraged and stirred let's pray together Father we love you Lord, one more time, we know, Lord, that we wouldn't know how to love had Christ not first loved us, given himself as our payment for sin. Lord, I thank you tonight that my heart, my soul, my spirit have been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been set free, and tonight we have peace that passeth all understanding. Lord, in the midst of these dark days, uh, Lord, the violence and the wickedness of these days, Lord, I thank you that there's hope beyond this life. I thank you, Lord, that there's a brighter future through the eternal ages for the saint of God. Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to meet together, Lord, in the midst of these two or three that are here, Lord, you said you would be there, and so we invite you here, Lord. We so long for you to meet with us and to thrill us and to stir us, Lord, for we are nothing we have nothing to offer, Lord, if you don't touch us and move upon us. Lord, we sure would like to touch and help your people tonight. And Lord, we know all across our congregation, Lord, some are in the hospital tonight. Some are fighting COVID, fighting this sickness and this disease. And Almighty God, we ask you, Lord, to meet with every individual, walk through every home. Uh, Lord, we would ask you, Lord, to give a healing. Lord, to our friends, our brothers and sisters tonight, Lord. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, you'd walk in some hospital rooms tonight and encourage your people. May they feel the prayers of God's people. May they feel an anointing touch from on high. Oh, God, may your people be encouraged. Lord, there's moms tonight at home. There's wives tonight at home worried and concerned. I pray, Lord, that your great peace and your presence 
would comfort tonight. Lord, for our people watching that so long to be here tonight, may they be encouraged. May they be uplifted, God, and may we in these last days get a greater vision and burden than we've ever had. Make tonight real to our hearts, Lord, and for all you do, Lord, we're going to thank you. We're going to praise you. And I thank you, Lord, throughout the eternal ages one day we will worship and magnify the blessed Lamb of God that set us free and gave us a reason to live. To God be the glory. Great things you've done, great and mighty and holy is the God we serve. Wonderful is the name of Jesus, and we ask this all in his sweet, holy, wonderful name. Amen and amen. What a blessing to be in God's house. What a privilege uh, to be able to come to you tonight. Just want to remind you, Sunday morning, Lord willing, Lord willing, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we'll be right back here for in-person worship and looking forward to that. And let me just ask you, church, please, please be in much prayer tonight for those that are in the hospitals, some that have been, uh, been admitted in the last two days. And I know there are several in the church that are fighting COVID and our prayers go out to you. We're lifting you up. We want to say to you, if you need us, feel free to call us. Our cell phones are on. And Brother Joseph, myself, Brother Shane Roy, Pastor, we are available. And we're here for you. And we will take your call. We want to know. We want to listen. And so be in much prayer tonight for these that are in the hospital. Well, I have asked Miss Macy if she would sing for us tonight. I appreciate her coming all the way from down in Sharpsburg and driving alone in this darkness. Thank you for coming. So she's going to sing, and then Brother Joe Kramer is going to sing for us, and then we'll get into the Word of God after another congregation song. Miss Macy. Jesus, you have everything. Amen. What a blessing. Boy, that's an old, old choir song we used to do. 
And man, I appreciate the words of that. I'm anchored in Jesus Christ. This world's rocking and reeling and uh, headed toward a burning hell on a quick pace, but I'm anchored in Jesus. And he's all that we need and nothing else. Jesus is everything. Brother Kramer, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for being a blessing to us. He's going to sing for us, and Brother Joseph's coming back to lead us in a song. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I would rather be His than have riches untold. I would rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I would rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king. Oh. 
think anything more, I'd rather they have Jesus than have some good gospel preaching. So we're going to skip this song and go straight to the preaching tonight. Brother Tom, thank you for preparing. You come and share what the Lord's laid thank on you. you. Thank you, Joseph. All right. Appreciate the goodness of the Lord. I appreciate the two songs. I'd rather have Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have everything. Amen. And Jesus is all I need. Christ is all I need. Praise God. He is everything that he ever said he'd be. And Brother Joe says, and so much more. And praise God. It's good to be here. Are we on to this one? Can I get rid of this one? All right. Praise the Lord. We're going to press on. Well, I am honored uh, and greatly privileged tonight to be able to be here on behalf of Pastor and to present to you uh, our portion toward the end of Revelation here. You have your Bibles at your house, and I hope you do. Moms and dads, encourage your young people, your children, to have their Bible in these services. Best thing you can do is make your house a little church, have your Bible, sing along with us, uh, worship God with us and get your Bible. So young people, if you need a Bible, real quick, run down to your room, grab your Bible, Revelation chapter 16. In your Bibles tonight, Revelation chapter 16, mom and dad, when they get back from getting their Bible, let them know where we are. That's in the last book of their Bible toward the end, right before that last concordance. And you flip enough pages, you'll get to chapter 16 eventually. Revelation 16 tonight. Uh, I don't have time to go through all that I want to go through, but I am going to take my time and take a couple weeks here and walk through this chapter in these vile or bold judgments. Uh, we've been walking through with our staff, we've been walking thoroughly through the revelation of John the Beloved, and uh, what a great presentation our staff has given, some great preaching, uh, some great teaching. Uh, I have been so encouraged at, at what I've learned. I heard my dad as a child, a young person, a teenager, I heard my dad preach through Revelation several times and teach on it. And as you get older, your mind kind of flees away. And so it's been good to be reminded. And I think in this day and time in which we live, in these last days, church needs to be taught and reminded. And I know there are some that this is your first time to ever walk through the book of the Revelation. And so I'm, I'm just so thankful for Brother Joe allowing us the opportunity to do so. And I want to kind of give you my outline of the book of Revelation, what the Lord gave me a couple months ago when we first started all this. And, and so I'll give you my outline, give you a little intro and some reminiscing on the seals and the trumpets. And then we'll get into, Lord willing, the first three vile, bold judgments here. Chapter 1 of Revelation, you see the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Christ is the author of this revelation. Christ is the key of the whole scriptures. The Bible theme is Jesus. We see the revelation of Christ in chapters 2 and 3. We see the rebuke and admonition to the churches. Chapter 4, praise God, we see the rapture of the churches. When the voice says, come up hither, I'm glad that I will not be here for what we've been walking through in this tribulation period in the book of the Revelation. Chapter 4, we are going home, amen. We're getting out of this sin-cursed world. Chapter 4, the rapture of the church. Chapters 5 through 16, where we've been studying, we see the reckoning wrath of God upon the nations. Then in chapter 17 and 18, we see the ravaging of Babylon. Chapter 19, the reunion at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's not mine to preach or teach, but I would be glad to do that also. Praise God, there's coming a day, amen, in the eternity to be that we'll sit down around the great throne of God in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see that in chapter 19 and chapter 20. We see the rebellion of Satan and his torment, amen. Amen. There is a day coming, Joseph, when the old tempter, the evil devil, will be bound and he will be cast into judgment, the lake of fire forever. And praise God, the church will deal with him no more. There are some no mores of revelation and that is one of them, no more Satan, amen. And then chapters 21 and 22, we see the regal glory of heaven and all its splendor. And John saw a new heaven and a new earth and praise God, Jesus is Lord of it. 
The Lamb of God is the light of it. And we will dwell in the regal glory of it throughout the endless ages. When I look back at these several months that we've been walking through the revelation, I'm reminded of the judgments that are occurring here in the tribulation and what we call the great tribulation. But let me remind you that these are not the first judgments that are poured out in the Bible. You can go back to the beginning of Genesis. In Genesis 6 through 8, there was a global judgment upon the world as God poured out his wrath upon man with a flood. And it was a global judgment. And God spared Noah and his family. There was a domestic judgment in Exodus 7 through 11 as God poured out his judgment upon Egypt for their treatment of his people, Israel, the chosen ones. There was the domestic judgment. There was the global judgment. Here in Revelation, we see the great tribulation judgments that God is going to pour out after the rapture of the church. But let me say that none of these judgments, Brother Joseph, none of these judgments compare to the great personal judgment that God the Father put upon His Son, God the Son, that's recorded in the four Gospels, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19, the judgment of our sin upon Jesus at the cross. That was a personal judgment upon Jesus as He took the worst judgment, Brother Jerry, that could ever be taken by anyone. And thank God Jesus took my judgment because I could have never paid it. I could have never endured it. I could have never satisfied. Oh, I could not have satisfied or appeased the almighty holy God of this universe. But Jesus took my judgment so that, praise God, I don't have to, Brother Joe, I don't have to face the judgment of this revelation. But by my faith and acceptance of Jesus, because he took the vile judgment upon himself, thank God, I don't have to face the judgment of this great tribulation. Let me remind you, Brother Barry taught on the seven seals, and real quickly, let me just remind you, and then we'll press on into the message tonight. In the seven seals, we saw the conquest. We saw a great war. We saw famine and death ravaged upon the land. We saw religious persecution. I believe it's going to be greater than any persecution that's ever existed in the last few centuries there was great persecution to come. There's catastrophic, catastrophic events such as earthquakes. The sun is darkened. The moon is turned to blood. Stars falling from the sky. And these, seal, these seven seals are open. And God is beginning in the tribulation with the opening of these seals, Brother jo Joseph, to pour out his beginning of judgments. And we walked through and saw how vast the judgments would be, how severe they would be, how awful they would be. And then we got into the seven trumpets. And what a great job Brother Harper did on the seven trumpets as he revealed to us in the trumpets how that one third of the earth is going to be touched by these judgments. I personally believe, as Brother Harper said, I believe it'll be one third around the globe. It'll be a global thing. One third of the earth is touched by these judgments. As God pours out hell and fire from heaven, there's a great fiery mountain cast into the sea. You say, that's unreal. That's like sci-fi. No, that's reality. Yeah. Let me say to you teenagers watching one more time, if you like sci-fi, get in the revelation. This isn't sci-fi. This is reality. And it ought to stir us and motivate us and convict us that there's a world out there that's going to face this fiery wrath and indignation of God. It ought to stir you as a child of God and it ought to stir me as a child of God to get serious in this day for a lost world as God throws a great fiery mountain cast into the sea and the seas, a third of the seas become blood. Then we saw that stars will fall from the heaven. There is wormwood upon the rivers and Darkness covers the earth. There are demon locusts, demonic locusts that will come out and they will bite men. And the Bible says, Joseph, that men will seek death and will not find it. And then we saw in that sixth trumpet the great army, Brother Harper, that comes out and one third of mankind, one third of mankind is destroyed, killed taken in God's judgment. Now let me try to put this 
in our common language today and put some mathematical numbers into this. Joseph, I'm a numbers man. Got up early this morning and this was rolling through my head. So I got on my computer this morning. Let's think about one third of the world's population that is going to die in this sixth trumpet that Brother Harper preached on. Today's population, today in our world, there are 7.8 billion, billion, 7.8, 7 billion, 800 million people walking the face of the earth. In the last year, in just the last year of our life, we have watched a judgment of God be poured out upon the land and 86.5 million, 86 million 500,000 people have been affected by COVID in the last year. That is only, listen to me, that is only 1.1% of the world's population. 98.9% .9 of the world has not even been touched by COVID. Of those 86 million cases, 1.87 million have passed. I think that's an awful thing because some of you and some of us have been affected by this disease. I do know what it's like to lay in the bed at night thinking, am I going to make it? Am I going to survive? Oh God, let me breathe. Oh God, let me live. Lord, let me get through this. Yes, it's an awful thing that we faced in the year, but only 1.87 million of the 86 million Joseph have tasted death because of COVID, and so they say. And that is only 2.2% of all cases. But in reality, church, get this tonight, in all reality, the 1.87 million that have passed is only two hundredths of 1% of the world's population. 99.98% of the world, Pastor, has not been affected, touched, or passed from COVID. 99.98% of the world has not even been touched by COVID. And yet, in that sixth trumpet judgment, Brother Harper, one third of the population, two, 0.6 billion, 2 billion, 600 million will perish at the sixth trumpet judgment. You say, how, how, let's, how vast is that? Can we comprehend that? Let's just say if tonight some catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event happened, Brother Joe, and India and China were wiped off the face of the map, there's one third of the population. And let me say, this COVID virus is, is wicked and awful. Brother Joe, you and I experienced it. Our church family's experiencing it. It's bad, but it's a drop in the bucket. Can't even touch the great judgments, Brother Joe Kramer, that are coming out of God's fiery wrath upon mankind. And now we come to Revelation 15 and 16 where... We see in Revelation 15 the preparation for these vile bowls to be poured out in the great final great tribulation of wrath of God upon mankind. The Bible says in Revelation 16 in verse number one, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour out your vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, 
and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Let me try to get these first three real quick tonight and then we'll move and press on next week with the end of these vile judgments. The Bible says that the final judgment, the tribulation, the final great wrath of God is going to be poured out according to John the Revelation in this, or John the Revelator in this chapter. And John says these seven judgments are going to be great. Now it is clear that these seven judgments are divinely from heaven. Verse number one, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways. This will be divine judgment. This is not nature's judgment. We cannot help but recognize the supernatural from the divine almighty hand of God in this. For this is the completion and final outpouring of God's wrath in this great tribulation. In this chapter alone, you find the word great 11 times. Now notice that this wrath, number one, the judgment is commanded. The voice coming out of the temple, you say, who's the voice? I believe that would be the voice of the one in charge. That is the voice of the Almighty. That is the voice of the shepherd, the sheep, the Savior, Jesus Christ. J. Vernon McGee said, it is difficult for men, even Christians, to believe that God is going to pour out his wrath on a rebellious and God-hating world and destroy the civilization after almost a century of great insipid preaching from America's pulpits. The average man believes God is all sweetness and light and would not discipline or punish anyone. Then he said, but let me remind you, he is a just God. Yes, he's a God of love. Yes, he's a God of mercy. Yes, he's a God of grace, but he is a just and righteous God. And let me say, you cannot spit in the face of an almighty holy God for 50 years and murder the multiple billions upon billions of babies that this nation has murdered and live in the wickedness for over 50 years, just the last 50 years that this nation has lived in in my lifetime. You cannot spit in the face of God and not expect God to be just and righteous. Now notice in the command of this judgment, the sequence. Now the voice, Jesus says, number one, go your way. Go your way. Each one of these angels has a way that they have prepared to go and pour out their judgment. And then the swiftness, this is the final wrath of God. So the judgment is commanded. Number two, these judgments are commenced. Now look at these horrible judgments with me again. Let's look in verse number two. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. What is this great judgment upon the land? Number one, this is the unexpected cancer of sores. The unexpected cancer of sores. As God in this judgment, this first vial that is poured out, demonstrates afresh and anew what he poured out upon Egypt. And that day in the sixth plague upon Egypt, the boils upon men. Now, notice in this judgment, it's very concise and specific. This vial is poured out upon them which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Here's these sores, these boils, Brother Joseph, in this judgment poured out upon those that had taken the mark of the beast and are worshipping him. And let me read to you, let me remind you, Revelation 14, verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation 
and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. God is pouring out his wrath upon those that have taken the lie, those that have been deceived and taken the mark and have bowed their knee to the Antichrist because God is a righteous God. He is God and God alone. Besides him there is none else and he is the God to be worshipped. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only and him only shalt thou serve. And God says you want to serve your God? You want to bow your knee? Let me give to you my judgment and he will pour out his judgment of sores upon those with the mark of the beast and the antichrist that have worshipped him. Now what happened in Exodus chapter number 9 when God poured out his judgment of boils in that sixth plague, Exodus 9 11, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils for the boils was, uh, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he hearkened uh, hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. What happened? God hardened their heart. God hardened their heart. You say, well, what's gonna happen in this day when this is poured out? Look real quick at your Bible, verse number 11. Verse number 11, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Oh, the same response, the same reaction, the same result, they'll blaspheme God. They'll curse God. They'll deny God. They'll blaspheme the God that so loved them, that offered them life, and they rejected. Finnish Jennings Drake said, when the angel pours out his vow, boils will immediately break out on the followers of the Antichrist. This humiliating and torturing malady will be upon the highest as well as the lowest. They no doubt like Pharaoh's magicians will be unable to maintain a posture bowing to the unbearable pains in the joints and limbs they will thus be forced to lick the dust of the earth instead of their giddy pleasures and pursuits of evil they will seek incurable remedies for their mortifying sores and corruption this will be a great hindrance in their bowing the knee to worship the Antichrist. Oh, is there a God? Is there a God who is sovereign and deals sovereignly and gets his final word? Yes. And God will pour out this noisome and grievous sore upon them. What are those words, Brother Tom? What does that mean? It means depravity, depraved, and full of pain. This consequence of rejecting Christ brings a physical pain and depravity that no man can bear. J. Vernon McGee said, God, what a statement. God is engaged in germ warfare upon the followers of the Antichrist. The scripture states that the life of the flesh is in the blood. These putrefying sores are worse than leprosy or cancer. As man discovers a remedy for one disease, another that is more frightful appears. These are judgments of God by which he reveals physically what man is morally, utterly corrupt. The first judgment commenced. The second judgment, the second vial in verse number three, the unexplained contamination of the seas. The unexplained contamination of the seas, verse number three. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man. What does that mean? Well, it's congealed. The seas have congealed. And this is not one third, Brother Harper, as in the trumpet judgments. This is worldwide. This is every bit of the seas. The Atlantic Ocean the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, it's all congealed and turned to blood. And notice what John the Revelator said, and every living soul, every creature died, now watch this, this phrase is important, not on, in the sea. Every soul, every creature, every fish, great whale, every creature in the sea 
is dead. Those of you that like shrimp and fish and oysters and all of that, it'll be gone. No more. Now how vast is gonna, this going to be? Think of this. Get this in your mind. Get this in your mind. The seas have congealed and turned to blood. Death is in the sea. And as these waves and tides roll in, Pastor, here comes the death and corruption. Here comes the death upon the seashores all around the world. Fish, turtles, whales, sharks, mollusks. It's all wrapping in upon the seashore. All the death, all the destruction that's come upon the seashore of the land. Can you imagine the stench that is created? And the fishermen, as they pull up their nets, pull up dead putrefaction. And man has lost, stop to think about it, man has lost a major food source. The vivid image of a dead person wallowing in his blood. All the seas will completely wallow in blood. The stench and disease that will occur along the shores of the land is unimaginable. Notice this now. Every living soul is dead. And I don't believe, Brother Harper, I, I may be wrong, but I, I don't, don't believe that this is those on the sea, Brother Joe. It says in the sea, man is spirit. God gave man a spirit. Spirit lives eternally in one of two places. This is soul. Every creature has a soul, mind, will, and emotion. Every soul in the sea is dead, is putrefied. The heaving billows become one vast stench of crimson putrefaction rolling in from the deep torrid of the coastline of the world, heaving themselves upon the reefs and the rocks, breaking with a vile stench upon the shores. The retreating waves of blood littered the sand with the rotting carcasses of its dead, and the globe is girdled by death. John Phillips says, from time to time, the coast of California and elsewhere, a phenomenon known as the red tide occurs. And Brother Joe, I believe, preached on this some time back, where the sea line becomes as blood and everything is dead, and all that's billowing in. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what these sailors must feel? Now, their life is gone. Their source of income is gone. Restaurant shut down in the last year. What will they do along the coastline, Joseph? When there is no fresh fish and no seafood and man is starving, man is craving, and now he has nothing. The curse upon the rivers Lastly tonight, real quick, and I'll be done, the third vile judgment, the unexaggerated corruption of the streams. Now God's going to pour it out on the fresh water. Not the seas, not the oceans, but now God's getting involved with the fresh water. Verse number four, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now you've got every fresh water stream, every river, Every water source for the land is now blood. Can you imagine, ladies, can you imagine being in the midst of this judgment, turning on your faucet to wash your face and put on your beautiful makeup and as you put your hands down or you put that washcloth down to take that water and wash your face, what you see come out is terrifying. Brother Joe, I wonder all across the world how many screams and shrills of agony will rise, Brother Harper, as they realize, oh man, our food source isn't just gone, our fresh water's gone. There's no water to drink. There's nothing left. You think of the reality of, just, of this judgment. What was the first miracle Christ performed recorded in the Gospels? He turned fresh water into wine. And now he's turning fresh water into blood. The first was given for refreshment. This one is given as a restitution to man. You say, what do you mean? Notice the righteousness of this judgment. 
verse number five, and I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, now this is resonating from the altar around the temple of heaven, from the very altar of God. Joseph, here comes this voice. Even so, Lord, oh, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. The beast and his followers have shed the blood of martyrs, and he's given them the blood to drink. And all of heaven is resounding in one triumphant cry. Amen, Lord. You are righteous in everything you do. What's heaven saying? I don't know if this is the right response, but it's in the Bible, Brother Joe. Lord, they deserve it. They've shed the blood of your people and you've poured out your righteousness upon them. All of heaven resonates and amen. That's hard to take, Brother Harper. That's hard to fathom that heaven is crying out, Amen, Lord, that's righteous. You're righteous in your judgment. Yes, Lord, they've martyred your people. Pour it out on them. And yet that's what they're resounding. That's what John the Revelators heard as they resound, Amen, Lord, you're worthy. I'm reminded that there is a holy response here in verses 5 and 6 and 7. But there's also a heathenistic response that I gave to you in verse number 11 as they mock God and they curse God and they blaspheme God and they harden their hearts. There's a heathenistic response. And I remind you what the prophet Micah said in Micah 2, 1, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Woe to them. And God is pouring out a woe. God is pouring out his judgment. And here's my thought. Here's my question. If in the fifth trumpet judgment, Brother Harper, God sends those locusts to bite upon men and they seek death and cannot find it until the sixth trumpet when God pours out judgment and takes life, takes one-third of the population, Joseph, but when you get to chapter 16, read this, outside of this judgment upon the seas where the sea dies, that which is in the sea dies. In the rest of this chapter, Brother Joe, I read it twice today, there is no recorded death in this chapter of man. Brother Harper, are they still seeking death in the midst of this and still can't find it? What I know what I know as we close tonight, I know mankind has been given some loving information that God loves you. Amen. God sent his son. God sent his only son, Christ, to be the Lamb of God and pay your sin debt. God has given his loving information to let you know that Jesus paid your sin debt and you don't have to. God has given man a loving invitation as he invites you to come to Christ, accept the grace of God, accept his merit of favor and love to take your debt upon himself, give you forgiveness. Yes, man's been given a loving invitation. Man's been given loving information. Man here is given a legal